You want to be on my team, huh? Let's see what you got. Pixar has another hit on their hands with Luca. And just like every other Pixar film, it's chocked full of hidden details. Whether it be keeping their traditions of the Pizza Planet truck alive, calling back previous Disney classics, or even hinting at what's to come from the studio, Pixar never fails to keep audiences on the hunt for references. Their Italian sea monster tale Luca has plenty of hidden references. So hop on your Vespa and let's start searching. There it is. That's how we're gonna see the world. One of Pixar's biggest trademarks of their films stems from an inside joke between the animation studio's staff, the number A113. This number has appeared as a license plate, graffiti, and has even made itself part of the plot in various Pixar films. Room A113. This is actually a callback to a classroom at CalArts where many of Pixar's top animators got their start. The number can be seen in the final scene of the film where Alberto hands Luca a train ticket so he can travel off to the city to go to school with Julia. If your eyes were getting a bit misty during this scene, you likely missed that Luca's ticket number is A113. You can go to school. <gasps> I can? If the diver's suit that both Luca and Alberto wore during several scenes of the movie looked more familiar to you, that's because you've likely seen it before in another aquatic-themed Pixar movie, Finding Nemo. The diver's helmet has the exact same design as the one where Jacques the Shrimp resides in Dr. Sherman's fish tank. It's fine. I'm not human. Oh, <laughs> thank goodness. Another Pixar staple is the Luxo ball. The signature ball doesn't always appear in its original form, as it has shown up in the form of a shield, a merit badge, and a steering wheel. During the film's climactic race scene, there's a blink and you'll miss it shot of the yellow and blue striped ball in its original form lying on the rooftops of Porto Rosso. Wow, it's fast. Alberto's lighthouse bedroom has plenty of hidden goodies for fans to look for, with one of them being a callback to Pixar's beloved 2008 sci-fi film WALL-E. The boot, which WALL-E used to carry the plant over the course of the film, can be seen lying underneath Alberto's hammock. Pretty cool, right? Yeah. Luca also drops some secret details to some more recent Pixar films, which we see in the scene where Luca and Alberto are swimming to the shore of Porto Rosso. One of the boats they swim past has the name Elena printed on it. This small detail is a reference to Abuelita Elena. What did he say to you? He was just showing me his guitar. <gasps> Shame on you. The Pizza Planet truck has appeared in all but one of Pixar's films and is a callback to their seminal movie Toy Story. The crew had to get creative with making the vehicle fit in with the film setting of 1950s Italy. Classic human town, pretty cool, right? The animation team decided to remodel the truck into a Piago ape, which makes its appearance during the Portoroso Cup sequence. Isn't it great? Wally's boot wasn't the only Pixar throwback hidden in Alberto's room. If you look closely, you'll notice a hat residing near Alberto's hammock, which looks quite similar to the hat that Carl Fredrickson wore during several scenes in the Pixar classic Up. Hi, Mr. Fredrickson! The hat wasn't the only detail that harkens back to Up. If you look closely, during the scenes taking place outside of the town restaurant, you'll find a poster advertising a soda drink. And if you examine it even further, you'll notice that one of the bottle caps on the poster shares a striking resemblance to the grape soda bottle cap that Ellie gave Carl in the beginning of Up. We're in a club now. Donald Duck is one of the Mouse House's most famous and treasured characters. In this scene taking place in Julia's bedroom, a plush toy resembling the classic Donald Duck design sits by the foot of the bed in one of the film's easier-to-catch references. One of the two other secret details hidden in Julia's bedroom is a copy of the original Pinocchio book titled Le Aventure di Pinocchio. This isn't just a reference to the Disney animated classic, it's also a direct allusion to the book's Italian author Carlo Collati, which ties directly into the film's Italian Riviera theme. Benvenuti a Porto Rosso! The second of two Pinocchio cameos takes place during a dream sequence, where Luca envisions him and Julia flying over Porto Rosso, before the camera pans down to reveal Pinocchio waltzing through the Italian streets, alongside the lame fox and the blind cat. This also could be tied to the fact that, in their respective films, both Luca and Pinocchio dream of being a real boy. I'm a real boy! The train sequence had several other secret features, including the number 04608 on the front of the train that Luca and Julia depart on. That number isn't just any old random number, it's actually the zip code of Pixar's animated studio. Come on, Alberto, the train's gonna leave. 
Pixar sure does love their numerical references, and they took advantage of the opportunities presented by the film's finale. In yet another fun detail, you can see the number 1200 PA by the train doors, which actually refers to the studio's street address, 1200 Park Avenue. In the streets of Puerto Rosso, you'll also be able to find posters advertising many films stemming from classic Italian cinema. But one of the posters is a callback to one of Disney's most famous aquatic-themed movies, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, which followed a team of deep-sea explorers on the search for, you guessed it, sea monsters. Watch out, Luca. Everyone in Puerto Rosso pretends to believe in sea monsters. An album cover with the name Nicolo Pietra can be found in Julia's room. While casual audiences might not think twice about the name, hardcore Pixar fans might catch that this is a reference to Pixar animator and voiceover artist Nick Pitera, who initially got his start making Pixar-themed music videos on YouTube and eventually went on to work for the studio. Pretty awesome. Pretty cool. He even provided his voice for the Triple Dent Gum jingle from Inside Out. Triple Dent Gum. No! One of Pixar's traditions is to have the directors of their films voice a character in their own film. Brad Bird voiced Edna Mode in The Incredibles, while Pete Docter supplied his vocals to Kevin in Up. Just to name a few, Luca's director Enrico Casarosa provided his voice to the unnamed mustache man wearing a cap, who can be found sitting at a table in some of the film's town square sequences. <laughs> <Scopa>. <laughs> Casarosa also included allusions to his first Pixar short film, La Luna. Julia's father, Massimo, closely resembles the fatherly figure in La Luna, and both films have plot lines that deal with a child's curiosity about the stars. To top that off, the main child from La Luna makes an appearance as a drawing in the end credits. Alberto, I'm coming for you! Another allusion to a Pixar short film appears in a climactic moment in the race sequence where Alberto rushes to Luca, holding a blue umbrella to protect his true identity. The pairing of Alberto's sole blue umbrella amongst an ocean of less colorful umbrellas appears to be a visual nod to the 2013 short film The Blue Umbrella, which features the eponymous item amongst a swarm of gray umbrellas. What's that? It's just the greatest thing that humans ever made. The Vespa. Hidden Mickeys have become a trademark of Disney's. Luca has one of its own, albeit its origins are a bit different. When animating the dream sequence following Luca and Alberto riding a Vespa, Casarosa and his crew noticed that one of the cloud formations resembled a hidden Mickey. Thus, they decided to keep the hidden Mickey clouds in the film. I am Marco Levisconti, five-time winner of the Porto Rosso Cup. A potential Ratatouille reference can be seen during Ercole Visconti's entrance. As Ercole and his lackeys sit outside of a restaurant, you might catch the restaurant's name, Gustosa. This is most likely a reference to the famous chef Gusto from Ratatouille, who owned the restaurant at the heart of the story in Ratatouille. Alberto Scorfano. Luca Panguro. Piacere. Trollamo Trombetta. You might think Pixar's Luca is just another hit animated film, but a look behind the curtain reveals that it's not just a movie about two teen sea monsters. It's so much more. It's a motion picture that shows us years of historical Italian legends and personal experiences from the director himself that all led to the true meaning behind Luca. Ready to find out what that meaning is? Benvenuti a Porto Rosso! Luca is yet another historical moment for Disney and Pixar. It's their first film ever to solely focus on Italian culture and heritage. As you can imagine, that means a lot of what we see transpire to Luca and Alberto, as well as the setting, has a real-life basis. Sure, Porto Rosso isn't a real Italian town, however. It's a near replica of the Italian fishing towns located in the Italian Riviera. As for the sea monsters, they exist too. At least in the legends of the Italian people. Everyone in Porto Rosso pretends to believe in sea monsters. When talking about the inspiration behind the sea monsters, director Enrico Casarosa said, There's a big history of sea dragons. For example, one is in San Frutoso, which has the famous abbey. It's a beautiful place that we definitely took a lot of reference from. A place that is known for a dragon that lives there. Along with the sea dragons, there were stories of friendly octopuses and feisty krakens that even had references in the film. Kinda sounds interesting. When it came to designing the sea monsters, they pulled out old Italian sea maps and took reference of their illustrations. However, they did have to tone down those illustrations a little when they saw it become overpowering in the film. 
Enrico said, in the beginning, we were drawing them really fantastical. We were fascinated by all these fins and all this weird and kind of decorative elements on them in the sea maps. But it was like, no, they're attracting too much attention to themselves. Things like the fins on the fish and the variety between them all came from those old historical items. According to production designer Daniela Strichlava, they wanted to make sure they kept the inspiration from the maps, but also be sure they were able to modify them in order to fit each sea monster's personality or home. The filmmakers even made sure that their underwater scenes were in line with the aquatic life in the Mediterranean waters, and more specifically, Ligurian Sea. Isn't it great? Plenty of research and personal experience went into the making of the film and Luca as a character. In fact, Luca and Alberto are loosely based on a friendship Enrico had while growing up in Italy. He credits his past BFF for helping him come out of his shell and get him where he is today. His family wasn't very present. He couldn't do whatever he wanted. It was the perfect friendship to get me out of my comfort zone and help me grow up. What does that mean? No idea. Go find out for me, will ya? The location was also chosen based on Enrico's childhood. The director would visit the Italian Riviera during the summer months, and his fond memories of the town were the reason for the setting of Luca. But, of course, Enrico couldn't rely on solely his own memories to create a movie on Italian culture. Who wants to watch me eat a big sandwich? Although he was raised there, he spent the majority of his adult life in America. That being said, he put together a team of art designers and sent them on a mission to Italy where they were tasked with getting to know the culture, food, and art in the country. Erickson thinks it's so important to get the feeling of the place, the light, and the details. It has so much history. The goal visually of creating Luca was to be able to transport people to this beautiful place that you would love to visit for real, but that you can visit through Luca. That's how we're gonna see the world. Overall, the goal of Luca was to portray the epic bonds of friendship. Enrico wanted to make sure that the movie's main symbolism of the importance of friendship was at the forefront and not sacrificed for added drama. They even cut certain scenes to make sure they kept it in line with the vision. We had much more of a quest, and we had a huge Kraken transformation at the end, a big monster finish. We realized that wasn't the story we wanted to tell. All in all, he was going for a Stand By Me in Italy vibe. Luca represented the confusing and challenging times we all experience when we're 13. The frustration of not identifying with your true self or unsure how to express who you want to be to others. Luca disguising himself was actually a metaphor for that situation, and another extension of Enrico's personal experience. Your life is so much cooler than mine. Those years where you feel odd in your own body and you don't fit in for many different reasons? So something felt right talking about that age with the setting of a changeling. Someone actually hiding his true self naturally because he has to. The contrast between the murky ocean waters and wide and never-ending human lands also helped showcase the cramped feeling Luca was experiencing as a sea monster. You just sit on it and it takes you anywhere you want to go. Then they were able to tie in the iconic Italian Vespa to represent the freedom Luca had as a human. Vespa is freedom. The ending of Pixar's sea monster fable Luca won over the hearts of audiences around the world and even made them weepy. What's interesting is that the film almost took a different route in its third act and would have played up the humans versus sea monster feud that looms over the film. Initially, the climax would have centered around Alberto transforming into a giant kraken, with Luca ultimately having to stand up against the humans for his misunderstood friend. The Luca team eventually decided to lower the stakes and give the film a more simple resolution, which certainly worked in the film's favor. They are the winners. Which Luca actor recorded most of the film from their mom's closet? We see the final product, but behind the scenes recording remotely during a pandemic looks very, very different than normal. This was actually the first time some of these actors had ever done voice work. Today, we're checking out the performers behind the voices that brought us Disney Pixar's Luca. I know your problem. You got a Bruno in your head. A Bruno. Jacob Tremblay is only 14 years old, but already a total pro in the film world. He's done roles in live-action movies like Room and Wonder. However, voice work is a very different experience and discipline. For Tremblay, it wasn't too much of an issue anyway since he has years of experience doing it. He's been the voice of Pete for the past few years in Pete and the Cat, and of course, he will also be voicing Flounder in the upcoming live-action remake of The Little Mermaid. 
His animated voice really brings this hilarious moment to life. Silencio Bruno! Silencio Bruno! Silencio Bruno! Silencio Bruno! Seeing Emma Berman performing behind the scenes makes it so hard to believe that she's still pretty new to the business. This is actually her first major project. Are you in town for the race? The Puerto Rosso Cup? While the trio may just be meeting, it feels like they're already at the beginning of a great adventure and friendship together. Emma Berman's sweetness comes through on the screen and behind the scenes, which is extra impressive considering she's not acting opposite anyone. Jack Dylan Grazer has done plenty of movies and TV shows already. I've been doing this forever. But it's still early days for Grazer when it comes to voiceover performance. It's, 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 it's been so much fun. It's really has. It really has. So for him, it was a big adjustment since he couldn't actually look at the people he was acting opposite. However, he really got into it and, as we can see, was definitely able to get his point across. Luca, it's simple. Just don't listen to stupid Bruno. This pep talk works. Fortunately, it wasn't as drastic for Tremblay himself as it happened behind the scenes. But he managed to portray the panic extremely well. He's dead! I killed him! The worry that he'd lost his best friend comes through perfectly in his voice here. This kind of acting should be helpful when he's taking on Flounder, who goes through plenty of panic of his own. Alberto communicating the fact that he's a sea monster could definitely be tricky, but somehow newcomer Grazer does a spot-on job. It's fine, I'm not human. What's even more impressive about this performance is that it was done out of his mom's closet. Very, very, very far from this quaint Italian town. However, Grazer had actually just been in Italy only two months before he discovered he'd gotten the part, filming another project. So luckily, everything in his life felt pretty in sync and he could feel those Italian vibes. Wait. It's called Phantom Tale. He'll get used to it. Watching Berman behind the scenes is so exciting because she's so animated while she's performing. We can see how it emanates what her character does on screen perfectly. Julia is an optimistic girl, but even she has her doubts about the abilities of these sea monsters, and understandably so. You can't swim. You can barely ride a bike. Set on disastro. We wouldn't be a fan of disastros either. How Alberto learned to walk so well, we're not entirely sure, but he seems pretty well versed when it comes to it. Luca does have a great and enthusiastic teacher, even though his instructions might not be the most helpful sometimes. Walking is just like swimming, but with no fins or tail, and also there's no water. The chemistry between Alberto and Luca is really special, which is extra impressive since the actors haven't actually met in person. That's right. They developed this beautiful on-screen friendship and all without ever actually speaking face to face. It was like, oh, wow. Emma Berman makes for a very good trainer, maybe even better than Alberto. There was no hesitancy in getting them into shape. The boys are definitely being well prepared by her as she's clearly thought of everything. Can you dodge obstacles? What if an old lady crosses your path? We would just love to see Berman and her co-stars performing the scene live as well. Learning how to ride a bike is a pretty amazing feeling for anyone, but especially for a sea monster who, let's remember, also just learned how to walk. Tremblay's enthusiasm radiates behind the scenes. Julia said, look up, and then all of a sudden, I was riding it. We can see that he and Luca are very similarly animated in their performance. The town will cheer our names. Ercole's life will be ruined. Once Julia has her mind set on something, there is no turning back. We can feel just how excited not only Julia is, but Berman, the actress herself. It was definitely really, really good. The enthusiasm about working with her new friends and feeling re-inspired really comes through in this scene. They definitely sound like winners. That's why we gotta win. One of the sweetest moments in the whole movie is definitely when Luca describes the dreams of his adventures with Alberto around the world. Every day, me and Alberto are gonna ride someplace new. It's a touching and tender moment that translates beautifully to the screen. Tremblay's presence comes through behind the mic and we can hear every single sweet note. And every night, we'll sleep under the fish. Julia is one of the most organized and determined kids that we've ever seen. I actually relate to her in some ways. 
Considering her positivity and how well she motivates the team, it seems like their chances are pretty good. We have one week to train. Pronte? A poste via! They won the Enthusiasm Award for sure. We love seeing Berman's physicality behind the mic. She embodies the character of Julia perfectly. Too much. My mom says sometimes I'm too much. No way. Not for me. Jim Gaffigan is usually a stand-up comedian, so it makes sense why his performance is so strong and his comedic timing so on point. All right, young man. You're not fooling anyone. His sneak attack on this unexpecting Italian child brings a hilarious moment to the movie, one that Gaffigan portrays perfectly. It's time for us to go home. His energy behind the mic really amps the scene up. This moment under the fish, or stars, depending on if you're a human or a sea monster, is a pretty magical moment no matter how you look at it. That's a torno. It's my favorite. Berman's performance is genuine and full of sweetness. We can really understand how Luca would become so excited by the world and all of its wonders seeing it through Julia's eyes. This is how machines fly? See, sí. And there are big towns called City. So cool, right? When she's on land, Luca's mom, Daniela, does not hold back. Even her husband, Lorenzo, is a bit nervous by her boldness. Honey, uh... Gaffigan's hesitant performance is very obvious behind the mic as well. Honey, no. I, I, I don't. It's amazing that his chemistry with Maya Rudolph was so strong, even though they didn't get to act with each other directly. Walking is just like swimming, but without fins or a tail. And also, there's no water. How many times did you catch moments in Luca that were eerily similar to Disney's The Little Mermaid? Step aside, Ariel. There's a new Sea to Land resident in town, and his name is Luca. Ariel and Luca go on similar journeys, as do their parents. From very familiar images to the same lines, we're covering 20 times Luca copied The Little Mermaid. Look at her! On legs! Considering both The Little Mermaid and Luca take place under the sea, it makes sense that schools of fish end up being prominently featured in both. In the 1989 film, the fish are present for songs and swimming through the sea. In Luca, the schools of fish swim through the sea, often following Luca. When he isn't busy exploring life above the sea, that is. Come on, gotta get back. Underwater treasure collecting is all the rage in underwater Disney World. Luca's fascination with the discovery of human artifacts and his collecting of them mimics just what Disney Princess Ariel did. What's more, Alberto's hideaway with all the human stuff he's collected over time reminds us very much of Ariel's underwater treasure trove. Ariel. What are you like? How could you? What is all this? Ariel and Luca have shared some similar views. We're talking about the fascination with looking up and watching the bottom of the boats in the ocean. While both are very nervous, knowing they do need to be careful when it comes to humans, neither can help but just look. Where do boats come from? <coughs> the stories of human monsters on land above are the primary reason that King Triton and Luca's parents give such intense warnings to their children. The people on land are a threat, so it's a fair point in both cases. The curious fish gets caught. Both Luca and Ariel are curious about life above and who can blame them. They're both fascinated with it and really want to move from sea to land. Ariel took action to follow Prince Eric, while Luca's main motivation was the idea of riding a Vespa. Once they're there, both end up being pretty big fans. The adventures both of them end up going on are pretty magical. You know, he's getting married! Getting legs for the first time is bound to be confusing. For Ariel, it only takes a couple of tries and then somehow she's waltzing with a prince. Luca doesn't have the best teacher in Alberto, so it takes a bit of time and some confusing instructions to get to the point that he's actually able to run. Both characters have to go through learning how to do this pretty basic action well enough to pass off as real humans. And they become experts very quickly. You're in luck. I basically invented it. In Luca, Alberto appeared to be the expert of all things human. He says he knows how to use all the objects, what they're called, and makes some pretty misinformed claims about the way the world works. Really? Yeah. And the big fish protects them. Sound familiar? Scuttle from The Little Mermaid claims to be the expert as well, with his dingle hoppers and thingamabobs. What? What is it? It's a dingle hopper. 
Dreaming of life on land can take a long time. So long that both our leads were caught missing from their posts. Remember when Ariel is missing for her musical debut concert? The same thing happened to Luca when his mom caught him missing from his shepherding post. Luca did at least think ahead and place this stone statue that sort of resembles him in his place while he was off adventuring with Alberto. Okay, everyone, this is, uh, Smooka. Ariel and Luca are passionate and rebellious souls. They just want to go where their hearts take them. It makes sense that both of them have strict parents. Both King Triton and Daniela make really strong points to their children about not going anywhere near the surface. And I am never, never to hear of you going to the surface again! No matter what. But in the end, of course, both Luca and Ariel disobey their parents' orders anyway. We do not talk, think, discuss, contemplate, or go anywhere near the surface. Among the humans, the rumors of monsters below are plentiful. In The Little Mermaid, the boat crew speak directly of King Triton and the wild amount of power he has. Thought every good sailor knew about him. In Luca, there are rumors of sightings and even rewards put out for finding the sea monsters, as if there's something to be afraid of. The pressure to find and hunt down the sea monsters is far more intense to divide between the humans and sea people than in The Little Mermaid. We can almost hear the song Les Poissons from The Little Mermaid as we see the very familiar actions performed by Massimo chopping off the fish heads in the kitchen. We've seen this before in Prince Eric's kitchen, where the chef was making a seafood feast for the prince and Ariel. Manjab. Sebastian, Luca, and Alberto all go through quite a fright when they see how the people on land feel about their fellow kind. Luca's first scare is in the town square when he sees the images and, of course, statues of sea monsters being attacked by humans. He and Alberto both get a big shock when this board with photos of fish all over it appears. Remember poor Sebastian's encounter with the very similar board of photos? While Alberto and Luca aren't as vulnerable as Sebastian at that moment, all of them look equally terrified. Whew. Ariel doesn't really know how to use a fork since she's gotten most of her how-to-be-human lessons from the not-so-well-informed Scuttle. However, she does think she knows how to use it and unfortunately shows off her believed-to-be skills to Prince Eric during their dinner. When served a plate of pasta with a fork, Luca and Alberto have no idea what it could be for, but soon enough, they end up learning how to use forks really well. They definitely had better luck than Ariel the first time around. Hey! <laughs> At the beginning of The Little Mermaid, we see a giant boat with fishermen catching fish aplenty. Except, of course, for the one that escaped. Fishing played a key role in Luca as well, since, of course, it was their first job, helping Julia's dad on the boat. That's where they also happened to prove they'd be extra helpful with their insider knowledge of life underwater. Your friends do know fish. In The Little Mermaid, we have workers at the palace hanging the laundry and gabbing away about the new woman the princes met. We do get another laundry line on a string in Luca, except instead of putting clothes on it, Luca's mom Daniela is taking them down to use the clothing for herself and Lorenzo. I'll just get this washed for you. We do sympathize with the parents of these wild spirited souls. Both have to go through the worry of their children being missing. King Triton has a crew of underwater dwellers to help him out in the search for his daughter. While Daniela and Lorenzo take matters into their own hands and make the journey to land themselves so they can find their son and bring him home. Or so they think that's what the plan is. Wow, he's fast! Scuttle the Seagull is the first one we see using the telescope in The Little Mermaid. Of course, his knowledge is limited and the instrument doesn't help him out so much. We see a fascination with the telescope come up again in Luca, when Julia uses it to show him the details of what the sky really looks like. And not to mention, proving to him that stars aren't fish. Mermaid off the port bow! Both King Triton and Luca's mom Daniela have almost the exact same line. Was I too hard on him? Wondering about whether or not they were too hard on their children. While they were strict, it's all just because they both care so much for the well being of their kids. Do you uh, think? Uh... I was too hard on her. Ariel, Luca, and Alberto all go through their identities being dramatically revealed. And it's not a fun experience for any of them initially. Ariel is discovered on the boat when she misses getting her kiss before the sunset. Talk about bad timing. 
Alberto reveals himself to Julia and then is caught by Ercole, who is quick to attack. Finally, near the end of the Porto Rosso Cup race, we have Luca revealing himself in front of the whole town after Alberto has come back to help him. They are the winners. In the end, of course, both Luca and Ariel get their happy endings. With the blessing and help of their parents, their dreams to live their lives on land come true. Then I guess there's just one problem left. Luca and the Little Mermaid almost had one other thing in common. Alberto's character almost transformed into a giant kraken, which we think might have looked a bit like Ursula's transformation from human to evil merwitch. What was your favorite similarity between the two sea-to-land movies?